been here before. Some of you guys look like new faces, but there's a lot of familiar faces. So we are talking breakfast. How many of you guys regularly eat breakfast? And when I say regularly, at least five days a week. Who does not eat, and don't be ashamed of it, but who does not eat breakfast? Anybody not eat breakfast? Okay. So at least I don't have to scold anybody. But the thing is, now if you talk to anybody that exercises um, consistently and pretty intently, a lot of research is now coming and saying, you know, maybe we should be eating breakfast for at least three to four hours until after we wake up. And we'll talk about that because I think sometimes the um, one or two studies gets in the mind of Dr. Oz and then all of a sudden Dr. Oz has it on the show and everybody thinks that it's the gospel. So we have to talk about that. So I give it, have given you guys three handouts and um, one of them has some recipes on it and we'll go over those kind of in the midst of the um, topic here. And then for the meet your needs breakfast options with fiber and protein, these are just some ideas of um, how you could spice things up a little bit. Things that are going to be quick, convenient, nothing that's going to take a whole lot of time. Um, with it. But it's what I want you guys to turn to is the breakfast of champions. So the one question is, is why eat breakfast? Well, a lot of research is showing that it does improve our cognitive function, and we also have better success with weight loss and weight maintenance. And it all stems back from this chart down here at the bottom the reaction of food, <coughs> insulin, and our energy level. Is what insulin is, insulin is a hormone that when we consume food, it is released. Now there's two types of insulin resistance, or I guess we could say um, two types of conditions that would maybe limit or inhibit the amount of insulin production. A type one diabetic, basically insulin is a key that allows your body cells to uptake the glucose, which is your energy. So a type 1 diabetic, they're not able to produce the insulin necessary to absorb or to transport or accept that glucose. You can also find a lot of people that are type 2 diabetics who are now insulin dependent. And what that means is their body has been abused enough, and a lot of times it's due to weight, that they also are not producing the insulin. And so then we have to do an injection, whether it be like a long acting, like a, a lamp, or if we have to do a bowl right before our meal. So insulin is required no matter what. A majority of us can make it ourselves, though. But is what happens, if you consume too much glucose, which is carbohydrates, then we get this huge amount of insulin that is released. Well, that insulin then will take up that blood glucose, or the intestinal glucose, and it will take it to your cells. Well, if the cells don't need it because you haven't been active yet, you're just sitting at your desk all day, it's going to get stored as fat. And so carbohydrates for our breakfast, if we're not careful, they can actually promote weight gain rather than that breakfast helping us to lose weight. So we have to be very cautious of that. On the back-hand side here, you see best breakfast choices, and it lists carbohydrate choices. When you're looking at something, I want it, you to make sure that it has at least 3 grams of fiber and preferably 5 grams of protein or more and less than 10 grams of sugar. If it meets all of these three requirements, that's great. If it's two, that's good. If it's one, then it's out. Maybe I could improve it a little bit. This is in particular with things like the cereals, the granola bars, um, any of those. Now you see the Special K or the Weight Watcher, um, Jimmy Beans. They have these sandwiches now that you can buy that are frozen and you, you know, pop them in the microwave and they're healthy. But if you look at it, they're low calorie, but they don't have a whole lot of substance. Sometimes you'll find like a Weight Watchers meal or the South Beach diet meals that are frozen, kind of like your lean cuisine that are more for breakfast. You're looking at something like that. It needs to have less than 300 calories and at least 14 grams of protein. <coughs> and if it meets those two requirements, I don't care how much carbohydrates in it, I don't care how much fiber is in it, but less than 300 calories and greater than 14 grams of protein. If it meets those two needs, then you know that your carbohydrates aren't going to be that out of balance and it's going to be so what happens when we do the fiber and the protein, that helps slow the absorption of our carbohydrates. So if you were to have this muffin by itself or this bagel by itself, all of that glucose is going to be going into the body. So we have to release a lot of insulin, and insulin's going to all take it up, and then it's going to be stored as fat. I kind of use the analogy of the rain, and if you were to get one inch of rain in five minutes, what's going to happen to that water? 
you know, it's going to run off. Well, for us, when it runs <coughs> off, it runs off into the fat cells. Whereas if we were to get one inch of brain steady over the course of a day, it's going to happen. It's going to soak in. And that's what the fiber and the protein do. It helps to slow the absorption, or excuse me, slow the digestion of those carbohydrates. So therefore, we have lower absorption and we have less insulin production because the body can then kind of utilize it um, a little bit more efficiently. Or if we do have kind of a higher amount of insulin, your body needs those carbohydrates and it's needed because it's not your food natural but not with it. So back on the front side here, it says, how many breakfast calories do I need? Do any of you guys know exactly how many calories you need? Anybody know that? How many calories I need? Okay. Well, if you've ever done, um, like at LifePoint, we have a metabolic tester, um, the body gym that calculates how many calories. Otherwise, there's some people that have used like your BodPod or your Fitbit, or even like an online program that gives you a suggestion based on your physical activity, calorie, or physical activity level, and then the um, amount of weight that you want to lose and stuff like that. It's, at first, I would have thought that was my phone because that's what my exactly. I'm like, I think I left mine in the car. <laughs> but if you don't know how many calories, the easy way to calculate it is to put a zero at the end of your current weight. So if you're 150 pounds, it takes approximately 1,600 calories to maintain your current weight. Now, that number is going to be different based on your physical activity needs. So if you're not doing any form of physical activity and you're 160, you're going to need about 1,600 calories. However, we don't all have a normal metabolic rate, so if you find you look at food and you gain weight, then you may need a few, a little bit fewer calories, or if you can eat whatever you want and you don't gain weight, you may have a higher metabolic rate and you can eat whatever you want. Also, if you're exercising, you need to add those calories onto that. So let's say that you're 210 pounds and would like to lose weight, you're not going to want to eat 2,100 calories because you'll just maintain that weight. So you could do one of two things. Thinking that 500 calories less per day would give me approximately a pound of weight loss per week. Or you could eat the calories necessary to maintain what you see as your ideal weight. So if you want to weigh 160, then maybe do 1,600 calories. Now, that's probably going to give you a little bit of a slower weight loss, but it might be something that you're able to do a little bit better because you don't feel like you're being um, deprived of some of your favorite foods and stuff like that. Otherwise, no matter what, 1,200 calories is the lowest I would go. So if you are 130 pounds, 140 pounds, and you want to weigh 120, or uh, if you want to lose some weight, you say, well, I'm going to cut 500 calories for my day, unless you're doing some form of meal replacement supplement that has the vitamins and minerals and a balanced approach in the carbs, you're going to find that your body will kind of go into a little bit more of a conservation mode. Usually people say it's your body's starving. Your body's not going to starve. But it becomes more efficient <coughs> in those calories. And you don't want to be this little Volkswagen Jetta or whatever those new hot bolts are or whatever. We want to be this big monster truck that's burning through the calories. And that's what breakfast does for us as well, because it gets that motor running so that it are inefficient all day long. And that's what we want to do. And so you notice here with the gives you your total calories and then the amount of breakfast. For most people, breakfast would be about a quarter of your day's um, where lunch and dinner, that might be, you know, about a third of their needs. Um, for some people, there's no way that they would eat this much breakfast. Well, if you had breakfast, let's say, at 7 and then a 9 o'clock snack, you could almost put those two together to be your breakfast calories. So let's say that you said, oh my gosh, I need 500 calories for breakfast. Maybe you could do your 300 for an actual breakfast and then do a 200 calorie snack and do two hours later. If something is consumed within three hours, that's usually considered a meal. Because it does take time for your body to process the calories that you just consumed and to burn them. Whereas if you're constantly eating on top of each other, there's never that gap in between there. And so the body doesn't really have any fasting time. Um, so really within three hours, we would consider that to be one meal. So if this breakfast was three separate things over the course of three hours, that'd be fine. And I give your protein and your fiber. Um, you notice you have five grams of fiber for everybody. And then with the carbohydrates, depending on your current situation, this may be greater or less. If you have diabetes, you'd probably be on a range of anywhere from 30 to 80 grams max per meal. Most of us are about 45 to 60. Um, and you can see right here, you know, the 18 to 2,000 calories is right there between the 45 and 60 grams of carbohydrates. 
This is what a lot of people overdo with their gut health. I had one gentleman who said, Judy, I just can't figure out why I'm not losing weight. I am doing the 1,800 calories I can get. Well, we looked at his breakfast. He was doing a bagel with jelly, a piece of fruit, a glass of orange juice. Carbs, 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 carbs. And no wonder he wasn't losing weight. He was doing about 140 grams of carbohydrates just at breakfast. Even though it was pretty low calorie, there was no fiber, there was no protein, and so he was finding his body can metabolize it in food. Sucked it all up and used it as fat. So back on this backhand side here, you notice that I put together this little chart that shows hunger control, or I didn't put together, this is um, out of one of my books, but you see it has a hunger control and then this time. This is another reason why we want to incorporate protein and fiber into our diet. If we were just to do a simple carbohydrate, so you look at, oh, my kids have toasted strudel, they have pop tarts, I'm going to grab one of those. That's a pretty simple sugar. There's not a lot of um, nourishment to that. Or if you say, I don't have time, I'm just going to grab a glass of orange juice. These are refined sugar, simple carbohydrates. And if you notice, you go from hungry and then you spike up so you're full, but then you're quickly going to have a decrease in energy, a decrease in your blood sugar because all of this insulin got released and so then you plummet. Well, have any of you ever had a low blood sugar before because of diabetes and you just kind of feel like you're a little bit nauseous, you haven't had a whole lot to eat, kind of sick almost? That's a low blood sugar. And you don't have to have diabetes to have low blood sugar. If you just give yourself a huge bowl of the carb, you are going to bottom out just like somebody with diabetes would have. So, so what happens then is you see these cookies or these donuts or whatever at work, and you're going to be a little bit more tempted to grab one because you need that quick fix energy, or you're going to want to go and grab that, that Pepsi, Diet Coke, caffeine, kind of give you that artificial boost back up. Then the next one you see here, this 30 to 60 minutes, these are complex carbohydrates. So let's say that, you know, all I have time for is a banana. All I have time for is, um, you know, a whole grain English muffin, or maybe a bowl of oatmeal that doesn't have any milk in it, um, it doesn't have any really sweetness, it's just this with some water. So what's going to happen is, you see here, your blood sugar doesn't raise a lot, because it does take time to break down those carbohydrates, but it doesn't keep you as full as long, and so then you're going to be hungry come noon. Um, you're going to be hungry at 9 o'clock if you had your breakfast at 7. And so then one of two things has to happen. Either one, we need to plan accordingly for that snack, or you're going to get in that trap again where it's just like, gosh, I'm really hungry. What does the vending machine have? What was brought in at work? And you're going to be more likely to make a wiser choice, but it's still going to maybe be too many calories for you. So you just had a 300 calorie breakfast, and then you go out and you have a 300 calorie snack as well. Then another shift that people have is they say, well, I'm just going to do protein. I know carbs are bad for me. Katie says, you know, those carbohydrates, if I eat too many of them, then I'm just going to throw on the fat. So I'm going to go the opposite end. I'm just going to have eggs and vegetables. I'm just going to have a chicken sausage. I'm just going to have a protein shake that only has two grams of carbohydrate, and I'm going to put it with water. <coughs> you know, I have a lot of clients that get into this trap because they don't want the carbohydrate. Um, one thing that a lot of times you hear people that are exercising, when we wake up and if we exercise first thing in the morning, we don't have a lot of carbohydrate storage. So we have to use fat for fuel. If you start walking on the treadmill first thing in the morning, it's going to take you about 10, 15 minutes to tap into those fat stores because your liver is pretty depleted. Whereas if you were to wake up, have breakfast, then walk on the treadmill, it's going to take maybe 30, 40 minutes to tap into those fat cells for energy use because you just got all this energy from your carbohydrates that you just ate. So a lot of people think, well, if I just eat protein in the morning, I'm still going to have to be going up in my carbohydrate stores. I'm not going to have enough, so I'm going to burn fat for fuel. Which is true, but then you see here, it doesn't keep you as full as long. And so then if you are not strategically planning, you are going to become hungry before lunch. And so then all of a sudden, that sandwich fruit and yogurt that you brought doesn't sound too good. You know, somebody commented about going out to and grabbing a chip thing at the Big D's or Val's or whatever, and that's not going to sound good. So I'm hungry. And so that's what happens with a lot of these people. They can make it to lunch, but they're so hungry when they get to lunch that they make poor choices. 
So our ideal breakfast you see here is lean protein plus compact carbohydrates. And that's what all of this protein options with fiber and protein give you as a combination. And that's been also where all of these recipes <coughs> come into place that I've prepared here for you guys. So let's look at what I cooked and then we'll kind of expand uh, with everything on it. So the first thing in line that you had up there was a bread. We're speaking of, there's plenty of these. If anybody wants to get up for a little bit extra, um, we weren't sure how many people are going to be coming to play up into some smaller pieces. I made three breaks. One that just had eggs and vegetables, one that had the eggs, vegetables, and chicken, sausage, and then one that had just the eggs and chicken sausage. The exterior is a pizza crust. And so this is the breakfast braid that you see in here. It's on the second page. Um, on the back hand side, breakfast braid. And this is kind of the original recipe, and this is actually from Cooking Life magazine. And I <coughs> sort of followed this recipe. If any of you guys come in the cooking classes at Life Point, you'll probably get a little bit irritated with me if you're a buy the book club because I don't like to follow recipes. I like to show you that you can change them up, you can vary it. So this would be a great Easter morning brunch um, for the weekend if you're having family come in. You could make everything up, keep it in the refrigerator, pull it out, and um, put it in the oven for 10, 15 minutes at the most. So with this break, is what I like to buy is the, and I wish I would have bought an extra one, I like to buy the thin crust pizza dough from Hill Trader. Why I like that one is you just unroll it and it's ready to go. Otherwise, you could buy the whole wheat kind of called rough thick or um, artisan or whatever. The thing with that is, is it's kind of short and fat, so you really have to spread it out a little bit. You could make it as small or as wide as you want. I just put it on a piece of parchment paper on my counter, and then I take a cookie, um, not a cookie, a pizza cutter, and kind of will go in diagonal and slice it, or you could use a knife, whatever you want. Um, you can do it straight if you want to, but on the diagonal, then it looks nice because then you can swap them over. In the middle, you can do whatever you want. Think of an omelet wrapped up in a pizza crust. That's basically what you're making. So if you wanted to, you could do even just vegetables. You would have to have the eggs in there. The eggs is going to give you a lot of protein. One egg is going to run you about 70 calories. One egg white is going to run you about 15 calories. So what I like to do a lot of times is I'll put in one or two whole eggs and then just egg whites or even use egg beaters. The same thing, a fourth a cup of egg beaters is what, 15 calories? Um, these all white, uh, three tablespoons, which is close enough to a fourth of a cup, is 25 calories. So this is going to be a little bit more concentrated um, than your fourth of a cup of egg beaters because egg beaters has a little bit more fluff in it where this is just so either way, whether it be whole eggs or egg beaters, doesn't matter. You could scramble those up, put different um, vegetables in there, or you could do more meat. Is what I got is I did these um, come from Super Savory. And this is chicken and beef sausage. You notice I had maybe a little bit of a spice and bite to it. This is just chicken in seasoning. There's no pork to it. There's no other um, really filler ingredients. There are tons of different chicken and turkey sausages now on the market. There's a lot that aren't even cooked yet. Um, for example, Jenny O has a um, chicken, or excuse me, a turkey, turkey broth or turkey sausage that has sun-dried tomato or jalapeno or the Italian sausage type that's raw that I take it out of the food sink and cook that up. Otherwise, if you don't want the smell of all that grease in your house, if you don't want to take the time, you can buy the pre-cooked stuff. And that's what a lot of chicken and turkey sausages, hot dogs are going to be on the screen is really tough. I took it and I put it in a food processor to kind of chunk it up a little bit, but you could just take a knife and cheese it and do it that way. Um, this is a great option if you have leftover vegetables. A lot of us don't get enough vegetables in our day, so if you have grilled vegetables, you could put those in leftover as well. Um, with the cheese, you could be um, as lenient or as surplus as you want. I actually just did a little bit of cheese, just one layer in the rest, and you know how it's going to put your cheese on the bottom, put your ingredients in, and your cheese on the top, all inside. I just did the cheese on the bottom, whereas the egg and chicken one, I put a little bit of just the cheese on the top on the inside, and I did sprinkle the cheese on the top of the two um, with vegetables. Um, I made the garlic and just put it in the one. So, so this is something that can be very easy, you can make up however you want, you can make it as fast or as 
pound bread weight if you want. So just see here with this breakfast bread option, you're going to be looking at 15 grams of fat. This is because of, one, your pizza crust has a little bit of fat, 1.5 grams per grade, that's not too much. But it does have your full eggs in here. This is not using the egg beaters. And then also with regular cheese. So if you wanted to use a reduced fat cheese, if you use egg beaters, reduced fat cheese, um, you're going to be cutting this fat down to six grams. So that's a pretty significant chunk taken down there. Um, protein, 15 grams. And then your fiber, two grams. So one way that you could spice this up a little bit with fiber is to have a pear. One pear has five grams of fiber. So now all of a sudden you have seven grams of fiber. Or you could have you know, your strawberries, your blueberries, your black berries, that nice little sweetness can um, work really well with the chicken sauce and stuff like that. How much fiber do you need for the Uh Five grams. If you use the skin. You don't need the skin. Pears are the highest fiber fruit besides kiwi. Um, if you take a kiwi and you take like one of those green scraps you have and scrap off the side, you can actually eat the skin. Um, that's going to give you lots of fiber, but it's still a little bit tough. So like I said, get the hair off. It's not too shabby, but if you leave the hair on, it's good. <laughs> good mess with it. Right above this, you see this banana protein muffin. How many of you guys buy protein bars? <laughs> they are expensive, or like we were talking over here, or very high in sugar. You'd be surprised at how many of them have sugar. Well, this banana protein muffin, um, I think it's very similar to kind of like a banana bread, but it's in a muffin. Look at this. If you see, the calories are 56. Anybody in here um, know the calories of their protein bar? 200. Most of them are going to be between 160 and 210. The 160 is not going to have as much protein in it. The 210 <coughs> a lot of times has higher sugar or higher fat to it, but it also has higher protein. So we see this 56 calories, 7 grams of protein. So if we had three muffins, we'd be basically at 150 calories and we're stuck at 21 grams of protein. Is that a better idea? No. 21 grams of protein. 6 grams of sugar. This recipe I did in here, it has the carbohydrates, but it doesn't have the sugar. This has 2 grams of sugar. And if you notice, where these carbohydrates are coming from is your banana. Oh no. I picked this up on my email last night and then I forwarded it to myself. Okay, and then I turned it off this morning. So I apologize. I didn't even pay attention to this. So three fourths cup ripe banana. And then there should be a space. Three fourths cup egg white. And then this is a new ingredient, half cup plain low fat Greek yogurt. And then a new ingredient, a three fourths cup old fashioned oats. I apologize about that. I can send it. I can fix it and then I'll send it back to Rachel so if anybody wants it. Like I said, they'd be like, so what's a three-fourths cup of egg white half cup? <laughs> anyway, so you see that the carbohydrates are coming from your banana. They're coming from your Greek yogurt, which I use the low-fat variety. The, it's the plain. There's no sugar in it. Your oats is going to have a little bit. And then your protein powder. Depending on what you get, this can take the place also as your Splenda. So in my muffins that I made you guys, I did not use any form of Splenda or extra sweetener because this protein powder has to be real in it. And if I would have used both, it would have been a very, very artificially sweetened product. In your baking powder, baking soda, the cinnamon needs to change up to be that pie spice, pumpkin pie spice. If you wanted to use chocolate protein powder, you could as well to have the same effect. So this bag cost me $12. Um, and this could make a of these recipes. And so this recipe, compared to your protein bars, is pretty significantly um, cheaper. So this protein powder, I got from Hy-Vee. I like it. Really, any protein powder is fine. This bag cost me $12. It's just a one-pound bag, so it's a little bit smaller. If any of you guys use the Vitalis Shake, or if you're using um, a Bucel, a Bucelogy, a Shakeology by Beachbody, you can use that. Um, or there's the Body Fortress kind. Really, anything's going to work with this. What's not going to work is going to be your slim fat protein powder. And when you're looking at a protein powder, to use with these muffins or even just on your own, there's three things I want you to look at. First of all, calories, and you care less about that because the calories are really going to be dependent on the nutrients that you have. And this isn't like the same animal as this, or right, it's already the same number. Total fat needs to be less than 5 grams. 
And then if you scroll down to our carbohydrates, ideally less than seven, this only has one gram. And then your protein needs to be greater than 20 grams per scoop and they have 26. So you can see that this banana protein muffin recipe, depending on your protein powder that you buy, may be a little bit higher protein or a little bit lower protein. These muffins, you'll want to keep in the refrigerator um, just for the fact that they do mold very quickly because there is no um, preservatives in it or anything. And they're very moist and so they mold quickly. And when I say quickly, I'm talking two days. So if you have a muffin every day, like a muffin and a piece of fruit, or maybe you have two muffins, um, you know, but and the gluten in my hand are a little bit better. So keep it in the refrigerator. So my patients are excited about that. Um, so how do you find that? What? That way. This, this is when you, um, Heidi. I know. Where? Oh, um, by the pharmacy supplement. And most. Oh, how fun. <laughs> yeah, you know, most. Like protein, that whole area there. In the health protein, that's where all that protein. Well, not necessarily. It depends probably what height you go to. So you're going to have your protein bars, which are going to be more in your health food market, and then your protein powders. And I know for a fact the majority of protein powders are going to be right in front of the pharmacy with the diet pill section. And the reason why they put it there is because the diet pills and Slim Quick, all that stuff, gets tasted a lot. People feel it. And so they want it to be right there in front, and then this goes well with it. Check pharmacy first, right in front of them. And same with Walmart. If you go to Walmart, all their protein powders and bars and stuff are going to also be right there in front of the pharmacy section. This product is actually made in Gretna. Um, they have a lot of different ones. They have a chocolate one. They have this vanilla. They have a vanilla cream or something like that that I also like in my um, muffin. Instead of the banana, if you wanted to use either applesauce or um, another fruit puree, prunes, plums, peaches, you may need to substitute it for it. This is going to be a very liquid um, item, so you're going to be able to put it in a blender and use a pharmacy mild food processor. I use food processor, the blood drop blender works just well. You're going to want to spray your muffin tins or your cookie sheets um, or even your liners really well with cooking spray just because the oat flour um, gets stiff. So if you're using a paper cup liner, you'll notice that a lot of it sticks to the liner. So in that product, and then also with this next ingredient, is Greek yogurt. Um, Greek yogurt, I think, is probably a little bit more hyped than anything. What really is irking me is I see this 100 calorie yo play Greek yogurt. Well, Greek yogurt technically should be yogurt and active life culture. That should be your two ingredients. I turn over the Greek yo play 100, it's got like 17 ingredients. I'm like, this is not Greek yogurt. It doesn't even taste like Greek yogurt. Do not buy it. Um, why it's 100 calories is because it is artificial sweeteners. Otherwise, no Greek yogurt will use artificial sweeteners. It's just pure up sugar or like cream juice or something. One thing that Greek yogurt is lacking is calcium. And the reason is, is Greek yogurt is basically your plain yogurt that has been strained. That is what Greek yogurt is. And so this actually is the Dan and all natural yogurt that has been strained to make our own Greek yogurt. So a lot of times you're going to pay five, six, seven dollars for a container this size of Greek yogurt. You're going to be paying, you know, two fifty, maybe three dollars at the most for this container. You can find these on sale a lot more than you can find the others. Like I buy this all the time, you know, for and I buy the uh, Best Choice brand or the Heidi brand plus a dollar for maybe $2 per month. Well, that's, I can make six thin batches of this for the same price as one Greek yogurt. So what happens is when you want to make your own Greek yogurt, you're going to take out the whey. The whey is where a lot of your calcium is. So with any Greek yogurt, if you are relying on this to be your calcium source, you're still going to need to take a calcium supplement. This one container is going to give you about 20% of your daily calcium needs. Where it's the same, you know, you'll play light or whatever, it's going to give you 30 to 40 percent of your calorie needs. And the protein, or excuse me, the calcium's in this way. So, what you'll want to do, have any of you guys made your own Greek yogurt or strained yogurt? Super easy. So, mesh strainer, any form of strainer, it doesn't matter. I have a circular one that I use at home, this is from work. But, like, if you have this, I'd maybe set it in a 9 by 13 pan or maybe set it in like a 
a baking dish of some sort or whatever. My gravel and I just set on top of a bowl. Line it with either paper towels or coffee filters, doesn't matter. And then you're just going to want to take your yogurt, dump it on it, set it on the bowl, put it in the refrigerator. A lot of times I'll cover it with saran wrap for the mess of the dish. Let it set for at least two hours. I like to do mine overnight, and that's what this was. This was that refrigerator overnight. Next morning, you wake up, you lift off the strainer, and you see all of this liquid underneath. Now, when I did, I made, I used three of these, excuse me, two of these containers, and I ended up with about five cups of liquid that came off of it. So you are going to get a substantial amount of liquid. So when you make your own Greek yogurt, you're going to get probably about two-thirds of your yogurt back. Um, maybe even a half, depending on how long you let it set. So it does shrink in size. What's nice about it is if it's too thick, you can always put the whey back in. But this is something you're going to want to throw away. If you try drinking it or try using it, it's very bitter, sour, and just tastes uh, worse than baby popcorn. Terrible. So you'll just want to toss that away. <laughs> but, like I said, super easy, simple, and you can even thicken it more and make it like a cream cheese. I like to put herbs or um, even dried sea beans or whatever with it and use it as a spread on top of toast or bagels or um, even to put it on your muffins or something like that rather than using a butter. So it's going to be a lot healthier option for you. The one thing with this yogurt, I like to buy just the plain yogurt, um, but you can get the non-fat or the fat-free variety. If you get the non-fat or fat-free, you may find that it curdles just a little bit. And when I say curdles, that's the wrong word. I saw your face, you're like, ugh. It's not curdled. It is, and maybe you notice with this, it's a little bit more grainy, how it's not maybe as smooth as this. And the reason is, is the fat free and the low fat variety to have pectin in it, and pectin is a stabilizer. And so it makes it so then the whey doesn't separate from your yogurt in the container. So you open it up and you might see a little bit of liquid on top, but it's not like you see the oil and vinegar separated in there. Well, there's no vinegar, but you get what I'm saying, how oil and vinegar separate. Um, and so that's what that pectin does. Since there's no fat in it or minimal fat, you have to have the pectin. Whereas if you just get the plain all natural, you won't have that grittiness and it'll be extremely smooth. The granola, um, the reason why I included this is just to show you know you can have a little bit more of an indulgent type breakfast or something that's a little bit more sweet without having to pay the price and to be able to control the ingredients with it as well. Granola is one of those foods that's very sneaky. It can be extremely high in sugar, fat, sodium, all the wrong things. And it's one of those things that's easy enough to make it on your own. One thing that a lot of um, granola lacks is fiber. And it's just because oats have some fiber, but not a lot. Your nuts aren't going to have a lot of fiber, and your dried fruit um, will have some, but not enough. So with this recipe, I actually put wheat germ, wheat bran, and flaxseed in it. And this original recipe, I want those to dump, they'll become a disaster for the plant as well. So if you notice here, on the very uh, back page, the granola, it just says to put in one cup of wheat germ. I did a third cup of wheat germ, wheat bran, and the flaxseed just because I had it. So really, you could use any of these combinations. Um, the wheat germ is what the germ is. The germ is the um, interior of your grain, interior of your wheat. And this is where all the protein or majority of the protein is going to be coming from. Your wheat bran, on the other hand, that's the exterior. This has um, your exterior of your grain, and this is where all the fiber <coughs> is going to be coming from. Both are great with omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and so this is something that you could put in your protein shake. You could put it in those muffins if you wanted to. Um, but I like to put it in granola just as an extra, extra added benefit of the fiber. Flaxseed, again, not going to give you a lot of fiber, but it will give you all those omega-3 fatty acids. Chia seeds, another hot thing. You could throw chia seeds in with this granola if you wanted to as well. This whole container of oatmeal cost me about three fifty. If you bought this same volume of granola, it's going to run you about $20. Granola is so expensive, and especially like your all natural, like you find the bear um, naked or whatever, you're going to be paying three, four dollars for a couple sheets or cups. So you could do a lot with this. And this is also where you can vary it. I put dried apricots, dried cranberries, dried pineapple in it. You could put coconut, you could put um, any.
Almond Dry Street, you wanted to it as an arc covered almond, you could put walnuts, almonds, pecans, and things like that. And this is something that I make a big bag of it, um, and I'll keep it in the freezer. I'm going to take out a little bit at a time, and I'll just sprinkle it on top of my granola, or if I buy a weight control oatmeal, maybe I'll sprinkle a little bit on top of it just to give it some fun. Or I might mix it with um, some more nuts or something, or sprinkle it on top of a, a low calorie just a nice way to give you some sweetness and some fun. If you wanted to instead of the honey, you could use agave nectar. I use natural raw honey um, for this, but you could use pretty much any sweetener that you wanted to. Instead of the vegetable oil, you could reduce this um, and use an applesauce if you wanted to. The oil, it does help to give it a little bit of a crust, though, so you don't have to use the whole big cup if you don't want so some other things here, when you're talking about bacon muffins and stuff, like with the, um, the basic muffin recipe, the reason why I included this is just to show you that you can have a, a basic recipe and change it up however you want to kind of do some different variations with it. You know, the protein's only four grams and the fiber's only one and a half. And so this is one of those things that you could make, but then you'd want to partner with something else that has protein. So a Greek yogurt or maybe something, you know, even adding some fiber, like a fiber source powder or something to this, and that would bump up the, the fiber content if you need to. So there's a couple things I like. I like stevia, I like stevia, but also the Splenda, the regular Splenda for baking and the brown sugar. This is something that would be nice for any of your recipes that you're making for breakfast or anything like that to cut down on those carbohydrates and that sugar. I brought these. These are kind of one of the new hot things with the vegetables as well. If you think of breakfast just as cereal, eggs, muffins, cinnamon rolls, you're really limiting yourself. I don't necessarily care for breakfast food, and a majority of my breakfasts are made with meat or vegetables, um, leftovers a lot of the time. And this is one thing that I really like. These individual peppers, I wash them, and I just kind of eat them plain. There's some that are even a little bit smaller than these, but these look nice. I'll sometimes even cut off the top and make like a, a chicken salad or a tuna salad and have that in there for breakfast. It's very portable, so I might make that the night before and then on the way to work. It's kind of like an ice cream cone in a way. You know, you kind of sit like that or munch on it and you turn off the filling inside of ice cream. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, you can't be turned out of ice cream, but you know what I mean. You know, I think that's the same difference of how you would eat it. But rather than using all the mayo in your chicken salad or tuna salad or ham salad, I'll use some of my natural Greek yogurt um, and then still with all of this. Another thing that I brought to you was Justin's almond butter, and I had all these coupons, and I was going to bring them to you guys, and then I looked, and they expired months ago. And I thought, <laughs> I didn't realize that they expired that, and I just got them. But Justin's almond butter, um, or any of your butters like this, they're a good source of protein. They also have your omega-3 fatty acids. Be careful because they are pretty high caloric. I get a lot of people that are like, oh, I eat two tablespoons of peanut butter for my protein. Well, for most peanut butter, it's going to run you only seven, eight grams of protein, um, but it has 200 calories, so that's a lot. There is something called PB2, if any of you guys have tried that. It's only sold at high V or at your health food section. Um, it's 50 calories for two tablespoons. All of the fat carbohydrates are removed, and it's just protein. And I like that. I'll put it in with my muffins. I'll put it in with my shake. I'll make it up and spread it on muffins, spread it on toast. It's a really good alternative um, to peanut butter with all the calories, but it gives you the flavor. Does this say what? Um, PB2, like the letter P, B, C, number two. Um, it used to be that they used to have this really homemade label, and then they were on the Rachel Ray show a couple of years ago, and then the next time I found it, had this very professional looking label. I thought they probably got some money from being on the show. Not necessarily just from it, but you know. This Justin's is going to be a little bit more expensive, but what I like about it is it's natural and it also is very thick. If you're looking at natural butters, um, it's something very difficult to come across, but your um, Schmuckers, all natural, Justin's, your PB2, Super Saver Mason, all natural, cashew butter, um, almond butter, peanut butter that has nothing in it, just that nut, or some of them have a little bit of salt, and I really like that. Things like your Skippy All Natural, your Jif, your Peter Pan All Natural. If you look at those, I just want to know what is all natural about this. You know, there's still tons of palm kernel oil added. There's a lot of different sweeteners, cane sugar, and yeah, those are ingredients are natural, 
So I think it's a little bit confusing to um, the client. One thing that you want to be cautious of is don't go fat-free or a low-fat peanut butter. Excuse me, there is no fat-free stuff, but any low-fat peanut butter because they really do jack up the sugar in that um, to make it have a flavor. And I would rather have you have the fat in the peanut butter than the sugar, just because you do need some healthy fat to work out. So, any questions? my own, um, but it's not very affordable, and I always take the yogurt with me to work. Um, one thing with Greek yogurts is you have to be a careful of the amount of sugar in them, um, less than 20 grams of sugar. So if you have more than 20 grams of sugar, you need to find a different one. And usually it's just a different flavor. Um, all brands have ones that are less than 20. If it's vanilla or honey, a lot of times that's going to have just as much sugar, if not more sugar, than your fruited variety.
But to um, kind of go through this, there's 186 milligrams of cholesterol per large A. Um, 300 milligrams of cholesterol is what somebody should limit to if they are um, on medication and their cholesterol is still not able to be controlled. Okay, so some people are going to be Just you know, most eggs have about 7 grams of protein. Um, and the egg white itself is going to give you 5 and a half.